Welcome to Prophecy in the News. I'm your host, Dr. Kevin Clarkson. Our guest today is Ken Johnson, a fascinating purveyor of ancient texts and uh, laying them beside the Bible. Welcome, Ken. Thank you. We appreciate your research, and you've done a lot with some of the lost books, and I'll be real quick to disclaim what some might understand. We're not talking about Gnostic Gospels or lost Christianities. We are talking about books mentioned in the Bible, such as the book of Enoch, the book of Jasher, the book of Gad the Seer, and others, that are uh, texts that, that really supplement or just enrich our understanding of Scripture, and we will always value and validate them according to how well they line up with Scripture. Scripture alone is the truth and text that we adhere to, but these can often be very insightful. And we've already talked with you about Gad the Seer, and then we kind of strayed into a, an interesting work about inalienable rights found mm -hmm. in the Bible and how that had bearing on our United States system mm -hmm. of governance. And now we're going to talk about church fathers, the early church fathers. And you have published a book this year called The End Times by the Ancient Church Fathers. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe I should just let you uh, be the one to stroll forward with this and, well, and introduce these guys to us. Sure. What I wanted to do is, is show that the early church fathers from the disciples of the apostles on up to the first two th centuries all taught the same thing. They were all premillennial, believed in a seven-year tribulation, a literal antichrist. Now say Jews. that again. They, they were all premillennial. You're saying that the early church was premillennial. Oh, absolutely. You're, you're saying this didn't start with John Darby in the 1800s? No, pre-tribulational rapture theory is what they say started with Darby in the 1800s. But you can trace that all the way back. A lot of people in the Middle Ages That's in right. England, uh, a lot of the Protestants did, and it goes all the way back. Well, of course, I believe that. But yeah. we have many who mock and, and make a case that it's a recent invention. As a matter of fact, uh, Church Father Irenaeus actually said that if you, if you didn't believe in premillennialism, you know, and if you didn't believe in the literal return of Jesus Christ, seven-year tribulation, that kind of stuff. Then you Thousand have, year reign. Yeah. Then you have no understanding of prophecy and you shouldn't be in a pulpit. Wow. I love uh, it. Yeah. They were amazing guys. He was one of the great apologists of the early church. Yeah. Definitely. Against heresies. Well, that's good. Talk what's, what's interesting about that book is that on the cover there, you'll see three main guys. Irenaeus is one. You wrote Protestant under there. Yeah. And the reason I did that <laughs> is because you've got the other two, Ephraim and Hippolytus. Hippolytus was an antipope. So he almost became a pope of Rome. Wow. Now, Ephraim was a church father, probably unparalleled in the early days, and a, a major saint. From the, Syria. Yeah, for Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh-huh. And so what's interesting is you pull these guys' writings together, they all teach the same thing on prophecy. So you've got Eastern Orthodox and what would become Roman Catholic and Protestant all teaching the same doctrine in the early days. So that's really amazing. Well, you deal with these three, and we'll, we'll take them one at a time. But mm -hmm. you do have just a, a brief uh, chapter on Justin Martyr. What would you say there? Yeah, I started off in the very beginning because I wanted to show how they all taught the same thing. They all believed in a seven-year period coming up later. Right. Most of them believed that that would be in the year or finish in the year 6,000 a.m., so in other words, they said a pr they didn't know. The yeah, explain AM if you would for, for our viewers. That's the, the Jewish dating system. Right. Okay. So in other words, from creation, we would have 6,000 years of human history and then a millennial reign. They took the week as a literal prophecy itself. Mm -hmm. Seven day week. Uh, a day is as a thousand years. Mm -hmm. 6,000 years of recorded hum of human history and then ushering in the Sabbath or millennial thousand years is that correct yes yeah yeah and that actually makes sense if you yeah, think it about it because you've got the seven festivals that teach prophecy jesus is the passover lamb right you know and, and then the end time prophecy teaching or the fall festivals teaching end time prophecy so if you understand that the sabbath the weekly sabbath is just another festival just like the monthly new moon festival right then there's something about them that teach prophecy so it's a logical extension indeed but they all taught that so somewhere around 2,000 years more or left after Jesus came the first time would be the second coming and there'd be a seven year period. They didn't try to set a date, but they just said approximately. Yeah. <coughs> See, so if you're talking about from his birth, we missed it. That would have been 1998, more or less. Okay. If you're talking about the event that took place in 32 AD, we've got 2032 uh -huh. and this is already 2017 yeah. almost as we speak. 
So we're like halfway there, just a few, another decade or so. Right. You know, okay. and then you've got a seven-year tribulation in there somewhere. But Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, most of those guys all taught this. I wanted to show that they taught them, and they said they were taught these things in this way by the apostles. This is, yeah, just, just the guys right after them that mm -hmm. were taught at their feet. So this is carried immediately forward. Yeah, Polycarp even made a comment that he was taught that Jesus would physically come back and reign for a thousand years, literally. Yeah. He taught that he was taught that directly by John the Apostle. Hey. At least that's his testimony. Right. You know, and I don't think these guys would lie. Oh, no. Text <laughs> might be tampered with, but like I say, when you get 30 or 40 church fathers in the first 200 years, it all tells the same story. That's pretty amazing. Well, what, uh, which one of these do you want to take first? Uh, uh, Ephraim would be good to talk about. Ephraim Eph the Syrian. Ephraim wrote something called, uh, they usually refer it today as pseudo Ephraim. And they try to say pseudo because it's fake. It was uh -huh. made up in the Middle Ages. And that's not why it was called pseudo. One of the church fathers said it was written by Isidore of Seville. And two other church fathers said it was written by Ephraim the Syrian. So they all knew it was a legitimate from the East, a legitimate sermon. Could be wrong, but it's an actual sermon from a guy back in that time. But they're just not absolutely sure which, which one of the two. So it's called pseudo Ephraim. If we had two church fathers say Isidore and one that, that said Ephraim, it'd be called pseudo Isidore. Okay. So it's, it's not that it's fake at all. But it's very clear in its teaching of end time prophecy, uh, pre tribulational rapture is very, very clear in that particular work. It's actually fairly clear with Irenaeus and Hippolytus also. But it's interesting. He goes further and just to combine these things. That they teach about the Antichrist, uh, seven-year period. Uh, in the middle of it, we have uh, a persecution of Jews that begin. Uh, we, we have just the basic outline of what we understand as Bible prophecy. And then they go from there and they add other things. So, for instance, he taught that um, <coughs> first, before the Lord came back, Rome would fall. Okay, that's pretty easy. We see that in Daniel. But then he said a Christian nation would arise and that Christian nation would fall. And then another Christian nation would arise. Then the apostasy would form. Then the second coming. So we very clearly see Rome falling in 420 or, uh, 476. The Byzantine Empire forming right. and then falling in 1453 to the Muslim Empire. Right. The Muslim Empire came. And some of these texts, it's pretty interesting, <coughs> talks about after the apostasy, which is after 1453, then these desert nations would arise. And these senseless people from the desert would form this army. One of the texts actually says they're called the Dragon Nations of Arabia. And I thought that was pretty interesting. It is. It goes on to say they, they begin this war and completely devastate the land of Assyria or Syria. And joining in with this war is Persia and Asia Minor, which is Turkey and Iran. And I thought that was interesting because if the, if the Dragon Nations of Arabia are all Arab, and these other two apparently have the same ideology, but they're not Arab. And they're not. You know, Iranians and Tur uh, Turks are different ethnic, but they're all Muslims. They all have this concept that they need to destroy to further the kingdom. Right. And it's just amazing the type of prophecies that are in there. So we have the basic uh, information given, but they talk a lot about things that we talk about. For instance, we, we know there's 10 nations that form somewhere along the line. We thought it might have been the European common market. Maybe not now because Britain has exited. So maybe, maybe not. You know, we're trying to figure out, is there a group of 10 nations anywhere? You know, and that might be it. We're just looking for it. But one of the church fathers, actually all of the three, make the comment that in Daniel chapter 11, it says that when the Antichrist uh, does his thing, the three of the 10 nations push against him. And they identify <coughs> from Daniel 11, are Egypt, mm -hmm. Libya, and uh, Sudan. Now we would understand it's northern Sudan. So it's interesting that we have the African block of Muslim nations that are three of the ten that rebel against the Antichrist. So a little bit of new information. At least it was new to me. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, do they have any... Um, obviously that is, but do any of the other writers share anything that was new to you? Um, and one other thing was I thought was interesting. Uh, <coughs> uh, they consistently talked about how uh, the Antichrist would be born from the tribe of Dan. Uh, and I always thought that's interesting, but 
I'm Danish, so how would, I mean, how would you identify, well, this guy was from the tribe of Dan. So uh, that doesn't seem like it's a pinpoint, like my name is equal to 666 or something. <laughs> but you're making me nervous here. No, my name's <laughs> I'm not. Just, I'm kidding. My name okay. actually ends up being 72, so okay. you're okay. Okay, you're creeping me out. I'm just <laughs> but one of the things that they mentioned, and I thought it was fascinating, the prophecies say that Jesus would be born of the lineage of David, uh -huh. but it would be born of the tribe of Bethlehem, or uh, excuse me, born of the tribe of Judah. And I thought that Bethlehem is actually in the area of Judah. Yes. And Jerusalem is actually in the tribe of Bethlehem. It's right, there's this little cutoff there. And it says that his kingdom, the light would shine in the region of Gad and Naphtali, right. which is over by Capernaum, Peter's house. So if you pull all that together, Jesus is born of the tribe of, of a lineage of David, but he was physically born in the area of Judah and physically started his ministry in the area of Capernaum. Mm -hmm. So if you pull that forward and say the Antichrist is born of the tribe of Dan, it doesn't mean his father is a Jewish guy from the tribe of Dan. It means he's born in the Golan Heights, huh. in the area of where uh, the Danites were to the north, the area of Mount Hermon, yes, where right, all that right. bad stuff occurred. So it's interesting. So that, that's more of a plug. So we can look at like Bashar Ashad. Right. He was born in Damascus. Okay, so he's you not you mean the ruler? The, the, the current ruler of uh, Syria. Of Syria. Yeah. I, I, ruler's not the term, but I... I don't know what his title actually yeah. is, but president or, or yeah. Barack Obama. He's on the run. I Barack mean, Obama doesn't make you know equal six six six, but plus he's over here in America, right? Right. Not over there, and you know, so we're told the Antichrist is from is the king of the north, the Syrian area, or right. some place over there, and being born in the Golan Heights. That's an interesting prophecy. That is. At least that's how they interpret it. Now they could be wrong right. on some of these points. Well, this isn't holy writ. It's right. it's. Uh, it's a step below that, but it is an enriched understanding. Um, well, let me just offer to those of you that are watching, we're talking with Ken Johnson. Uh, this is his book, one of his most recent from, last, uh, from this year, The End Times by the Ancient Church Fathers. And uh, very fascinating stuff. This is available for thirteen ninety five plus shipping and handling, uh, as always, at our website bookstore, prophecyofthenews.com or calling the 800 number on your screen. But I would also say that <coughs> we're offering along with this uh, two DVDs, and you can purchase these, you know, either one individually or as a set. They are 1995 uh, individually, but both can be had for 34.95. Volume one is the prophecy series, The Prophetic Timeline. Now this traces through Daniel, mm -hmm. and many will be familiar with this prophecy that shows the day of... Uh, you know, Christ arriving to be cut off. Mm -hmm. But you say that the exact dates of the return of the state of Israel, 1948, and then the capture of Temple Mount in 1967 are uh, contained there as well. Yeah, they are. We're and told so not to look for the date of the rapture, but right. that's actually the exception to the rule. Uh -huh. There are many prophecies in Scripture that were given to the date, and that's two of them that's in our time period. This is a fascinating thing, and then the, the companion to it is the prophecy series, The Church Age. And you are looking at a scripture, prophecy in Zechariah 3, about a seven-faced stone and yeah, the age the of grace. Yeah, the, the prophecy in Zechariah 3 says that there's a seven-sided stone and it's got an inscription written yeah. on it that's important for you to read, but then it doesn't tell you what the inscription is. Right. And you have to go figure out where it's at. And once you do and pull it together, it actually talks about the pierced one's salvation, creating the age of grace. And it's an amazing prophecy about the church age. And we branch off for that. And of course, it's seven sided. I think right. we know now because Revelation, there's seven church ages. Uh -huh, in the church uh -huh. age. But it branches off of that. And we go through the prophecies that were in the first century and then even all the way up through our time. Fascinating stuff. So you want to check these out and uh, be aware of those. Well, I might just, uh, <coughs> I obviously want you to have a reason for people to pursue this and get it but uh you know i've not really followed the line of a timeline uh, or the idea of a timeline uh pertaining to the rebirth of israel and the reclamation of the temple mount uh, what what uh directions do those come from in daniel they're not in chapter nine i suppose they're no actually chapter nine is probably the easiest one uh -huh. to understand because it clearly says from a certain point 
so two many days, year, right. Messiah's cut years, off. Right. So if you get those on the, you find out exactly what those dates were, and then you, you, that's their calendar. You just convert it to our calendar. Right. And that's when Christ arrives and is offered as the Messiah and then is cut off. Mm-hmm. And but that comes out to be April 6, 32 A.D. So it's an amazing It is prophecy. amazing. But then the, uh, the, the rebirth of the nation, is that out of chapter 10 or 11? Or uh, it's after, uh, <laughs> chapter, I believe, 4 and 5. It, it's a coded, oh, it's earlier. It's okay. a coded prophecy. Like one of them is the handwriting on the wall. Ah, I it's see. It's a dual uh, prophecy because if you take them as verbs, it means what Daniel says. You're uh-huh. cut off today uh-huh. and your kingdom is divided. If you take them as nouns, they're units of, of money. So you just add those up and find out when that took place. And then you go forward the exact number of days that using the same formula on the calendar. And all of a sudden you come up to May 14th, 1948. Interesting. Interesting. Very. You know, and there's another one for the same thing. They take the Temple Mount back, but they don't build a temple because of the strange people in the area that try to prevent them back there with Ezra. And again, there's another number system and you do the same thing and you go forward and it comes up to be. Um, June 6th, 1967. Wow. And again, those things, they, they, one could be a coincidence, two could be manip- me ma- manipulating the numbers, but not three sets of dates. That's six different numbers, and they all got to come out just right using right. the same formula. Right. No. Uh, you've done another work on fulfilled prophecies about Israel, I think, and I don't know how many you document in there. Yeah, over 500 prophecies. That have already been fulfilled. Yeah, well, 50 prophecies with Israel. Yeah. Yeah, okay. in that work, I wanted to start from the pre-flood world and go forward and show all the stuff we learned in Sunday school. Uh-huh. And then you get up to things that you remember reading yesterday in the newspaper. And you hopefully you get the idea that this stuff is real. The whole thing is yeah. real. God has been active in history. He hasn't been gone for 2,000 years. Things are occurring as prophesied. No new prophecies. But just out of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and uh, Obadiah, are you know, some of those things are yet future. And the Lord tells us in, in Isaiah that I declare the end from the beginning so mm-hmm. that when these things happen, you may know that I am he. Mm-hmm. And uh, to me, my faith just soars when I see these kind of uh, confirmations of the hand of God. I think it's interesting the church fathers, I mean, they, they're, they would make a list of sins too, like you shouldn't get drunk, you shouldn't kill people, etc., but the church fathers make it very clear that forsaking the study of Bible prophecy is a serious sin. Ah, and it will, it will be a major, major sin that is constant in the last days. A lot of pastors and seminaries are sinning then. According to what they said. Because it's fewer and further between that mm-hmm. we find uh, real prophetic voices today that are. And we shouldn't argue on anything. We should try to study. But yeah. well, Revelation says if you read it, you get blessed. And exactly. if you don't, you're not. I want a blessing. Amen. Amen. Well, when do you think that this, um, you know, you're talking one generation after the apostles uh, teaching a pre-tribulation, pre-millennial approach. When do you think this understanding began to be corrupted or lost? What caused that? That's actually really easy. Okay. Eusebius, the father of church history, records the whole thing. In his work, he officially says, we're all millennial. It's the party line to get the book published. That's what he says in the book. And then he turns around in the history of the book and tells you what happened. Uh, The Gnostics got a foothold in Egypt and started teaching when we enter the millennial reign, it's going to be party time. Lots of alcohol, lots of drugs, 70 virgins, you know, (laughs) where they get that stuff. Muslims got it from the Gnostics. And most of the church fathers said, that's sin. We don't don't live a holy life so we go to heaven and sin. What are you talking about? And so they begin to say, well, you're taking Revelation literally and it should be symbolic and there was these allegories that developed and that's when because it began to that. spin forward and it actually started with what was called the schism of nepos he was a bishop in in egypt who wrote a book called refutation of the allegories showing how gnostics are wrong and but that's wrong too because we have to literally interpret this but there was a something happened and that that century everything flipped and the churches started saying Revelation is symbolic. And as a matter of fact, we're not going to read it in the churches. Yeah. And that's how that all started. But the, f- the fact that the whole thing is recorded, we're all premillennial till the schism of Nepos. And we know why and who and how and when. And then from that point forward, we ignore prophecy. I see. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And of course, uh, Augustine in the, you know, Bishop of Hippo, he, he, he wrote the City of God. and. Mm-hmm. He really codified, I think, 
uh, uh, millennialism, the mm-hmm. idea of that uh, whole thing being symbolical. It's a shame because even the Jewish understandings were so uh, literal, and even Jewish writings, I've been reading some research recently, uh, just looking at their own messianic expectations. They are digging into, even though they're kind of blinded about Jesus, they are digging into these specifics of mm-hmm. his coming the second time. They think it's the first time, but mm-hmm. uh, they're taking it very mm-hmm. literally. Yeah, it, it's it's about time for that to happen. Eventually, Israel's eyes will be open Indeed. according to prophecy. So Amen. we're actually seeing it. We're seeing the Temple Institute. We're seeing now that <coughs> the sacrifices, the practice sacrifices have been reinstituted, which occurred on the very first of the blood moons. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, that I had friends tell me that nothing ever happened. It's like you weren't looking in the right place. Huh. Lots of stuff going on. Lots of stuff going on. It's exciting time. Uh, well, do you, do you, besides these witnesses, did you find uh, lesser known uh, early writings sprinkled in there referring to this? I mean, these are the primary yeah. ones, but, but they weren't the only yeah, um, the church fathers taught everything that we t- we understand. The new stuff, like being born in Antichrist, being born in the Golan Heights, but that is a their interpretation, at least, right. of a certain Bible scripture. But there were four prophecies they gave that I couldn't find in the scriptures anywhere. Two of which were fulfilled back in the 600s A.D., and two haven't been fulfilled yet. So I went digging and trying to find these things, and I actually found what they were quoting, some o- other scrolls. One of them was the book of Gad, which we've just come up with, and another one I'm still working on. But the prophecies are pretty amazing, putting them together. Wow. Well, and and I suppose there are more witnesses besides these three, uh, but maybe they didn't say as much, or maybe just uh, individual letters from those. Uh, you spent so much time in those documents. Uh, do you find more references to prophecy? Um, a lot of stuff saying the same thing over and over again. Yeah, so that's there is what a I lot of mean. that. A lot of sermons along those lines. Just echoes of the same. Mm-hmm. Right. Then we'll have like <coughs> little quotes of something, and you'll try to figure out who was he quoting uh, church like his 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 disciple or his master uh, or an, a church father or an apostle or something. Like that. So it's kind of hard sometimes, but. The main thing is not necessarily who wrote them and when, but what did they say? And it's nice to see the first two centuries agreeing on basically everything. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. If you're a Baptist or a Nazarene or just a general Protestant, and what you probably think the Scripture says is probably exactly what the church fathers taught. Did they, uh, I'm sure, uh, appeal to uh, the Scriptures, a revelation, but did they have other things that they may be found as favorites to appeal to like sayings of Jesus or the book of Daniel or did you see a heavy weight toward any one scriptural yeah uh, as far as prophecy goes they, yeah. they quoted uh, Revelation a lot uh, Daniel a lot and then some of the some of the uh, prophecies in Isaiah as a matter of fact they gave you an excellent piece of advice to figuring out prophecy they said you you find a prophecy where it says when Israel returns I will do one two three four five and you look carefully at that passage, and if it's Israel coming back from the north uh-huh. or from one place, then it's under Cyrus, and it's sometime after 536 B.C. that these things occur. If you find where it says, I'll come, I'll come back from all the countries or from scattered the four corners of the earth, something like that, then it's going to be the time of the Romans. So that stuff begins to take place after 1948 A.D. Wow. And then they say, based on Amos chapter 9, there's only going to be two returns. So Hmm. you can break up all, and that may or may not be true, but that's how they taught it. So you can break this up. Irenaeus actually said, when you see the Jews return, that's when the the prophecy of Daniel about knowledge being increasing will be begin to be fulfilled. Because we will see all those other prophecies begin to be fulfilled, and you'll know exactly what the symbols mean. Well, bingo to the knowledge increasing from about that time. Mm Mm-hmm. Seriously, that's uh, computer age began in the late 50s and, you know, going forward, it's it's amazing what has happened with that. Oh, yeah. That's a uh, that's amazing. Well, Ken Johnson is our guest and we are talking and I might just ask a more general question off of this, not on this one book, but just out of all your research, uh, you might just in this final show uh, tell the folks what led you into studying all of this we mentioned it at the beginning but that's been a few weeks ago oh yeah well 
I uh, became a Christian at 12, and I went to different denominations or churches, you know, Baptist, Nazarene, Pentecostal, a few different ones. Mm -hmm. And they all basically believe the same thing, Jesus and him crucified. But there are probably 10 or 20 little doctrines that may or may not be important, but they tend to divide on those. And so I wanted to try to figure out what the answer is to those things. Uh, do the gifts continue or did they cease? Just how do you reveal prophecy? How do you reveal mm -hmm. Israel? And so I went back to the studying Jesus and the apostles, and they're pretty clear. But what they're not clear on is what we are dividing over. So then I went back and found the writings of the disciples of the apostles. Somebody who told me, well, I talked to Peter and he said this. And I tried to pull all those together and come up. It's pretty much what you would think it would be. If you study the scriptures a long time, you'll come to the same conclusions. But it was nice to be able to be told stuff like that. For instance, there's a, a writing of uh, Irenaeus who was fighting a cult that said that they were the 144,000 in his time. And so he was right. A Witnessing treatise. for Jehovah, were they? <laughs> yes, they were. <laughs> <coughs> but they said that he was going to write this book against them and he wanted to make sure he was correct. So he wrote to Polycarp to say, I don't think I fully understand the Antichrist being 666. How does that work exactly? Polycarp wrote a letter back to him, said, I didn't know either. So I went and asked John. Oh. This is what John told me. So he begins to explain <laughs> how you interpret that. Okay. Now, if that's correct and hasn't been tampered with, it's not in Scripture, but if they're not lying to us, somebody asked John. Yeah. And John said, this is what the Holy Spirit told me about that passage. That's something I'd want to know. Me too. You know? And so there's a bunch of stuff like that. Fascinating. Just, and you just got to read their sermons, and it's very dry, and it takes a long time. But pulling stuff like that out of those sermons is amazing. And that leads me into all this other stuff, the extra scrolls. And for instance, the church fathers said they liked Enoch and s considered it genuine. But there's second Enoch, third Enoch, and there's a few others. Right. And they said those were written by cults. We know who wrote them. We knew why they wrote them. And we knew when they wrote them. So ignore them. So it's nice to have stuff like that. Read this scroll. Right. Don't read that one. That is good. That is good. So when you look at the two, you begin to get a flavor of this sounds real and that sounds very fake. Wow. You know, and so after a while, it becomes kind of almost commonplace that that sounds fishy. Yeah. You know, and this one, I can't find a thing wrong with it. And that's odd. You know, so it's really neat. Well, thanks for being with us. Our guest has been Ken Johnson. We're obviously looking at the second coming of Christ, but don't forget the first coming. He came for you to die for your sins. He rose from the dead to give you eternal life. Call on his name and be saved, and we'll keep looking up. Thank you.